with the seven years we've been doing this, I will tell you that in the United States, we are woefully behind in the uh, activation of these programs. Uh, there, are, there are countries that are further ahead. There are institutions that are further ahead than a lot of the institutions in the United States and certainly here in Maryland. So we created this fellowship, which has grown into an international fellowship, and we'll get to that in just a second. But let me talk a little bit about Open in Action at Montgomery College. We started this journey in 2017, where we were actually able to quantify how much we were saving students. Uh, we had an Achieving the Dream grant that allowed us to provide faculty with what amounts to at least time to do this work. And since 2017, we've realized students' uh, textbook savings of a little more than $13 million. But as we got into the, the work, and students were real excited, and you heard Robin talk a little bit this morning, it's not about textbook savings. But the students, it is about textbook savings, right? It's, that's, for them, a big part of what um, their, their fees go to or their, 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 their financial costs of higher education. But we were having a hard time getting a lot of our faculty involved because I was a faculty member. Textbook representative came to me when I was teaching journalism. I signed off on the textbook. It went to the bookstore. I had no idea how much the book cost. Right. I don't know if you experienced that or your colleagues experienced that, but it's it's a reality. It was a reality in my situation. So we realized we had to pivot from focusing on the cost of textbooks to the learning outcomes, because that's what faculty really were interested in. How much harm am I going to do academically if I don't use one of these glossy, high finished, exorbitant textbooks. And so we moved to focus on student learning. So since 2017, we've been able to collect some data each semester that breaks down our Z courses by ethnicity and by gender. And what we have been able to show consistently is that students who are in our Z courses are doing as well or better than in the non-Z courses as a whole, okay? Um, and that was important because we were able to take that information back to the faculty and say, look, you're not doing any harm to your students. And in the process, you're saving them hundreds of dollars, in some case, thousands of dollars, depending on their, their discipline. So as we focused on success, and you know that was all well and good, we had to move to the social justice act aspect of it. And this is where the open pedagogy part came in. Um, as Robin said, and you'll see on a, a slide, this isn't just an issue about textbook affordability. It's an access issue. And what we were realizing was that students wanted to focus on the social justice issues that were being played or being uh, available in Montgomery County. And so we developed the SDG Fellowship. I want to give a shout out to, to Robin and good friend Rajiv, who came up with this definition of open pedagogy. And I think it's in the open pedagogy notebook that Robin referenced. Um, and you can see some of the things that she mentioned in her slide. And as she said, you know, open pedagogy and the definition of open pedagogy has different iterations depending on where you are in that process. Uh, but you'll see the social justice part in there. You'll see the learning and teaching part and the technology. All those components that she was referencing this morning um, in her, her talk. So a little bit of, about our background. Uh, Shint and I were in Anaheim in 2017, attending a, the Open Ed Conference. And we decided we were going to sit on a, in on a presentation that Cable Green was, was giving. And Cable was talking about 
the SDGs and UNESCO and where we were going with the SDGs. Um, this was all before the big push on climate change. And I think, you know, it's, it's interesting that we've come full circle, I think, where we started not focusing a whole lot on, on climate change, but as the years have progressed around the SDGs, we have now seen how valuable the SDGs can be in this space. But we left Anaheim and we thought, how do we marry this idea of the sustainable development goals with open pedagogy? And so we came back to, to our offices in Montgomery County and developed this fellowship that is basically a summer fellowship for our faculty. And our first year was in 2018. The following year in 2018, the fall of 2018, we were given a, a roundtable discussion at another open ed conference in Niagara and Rajiv came up. And I don't know those of you who know Rajiv, at least to me, he was the godfather of open at that point. So when Rajiv came up and said he'd like to partner, at that time he was at Quantlin Polytech, it was a, a big point of excitement for us. So when, in the summer of 2019, we partnered with KPU, a, a four-year school in Canada. Uh, and then since then, it has simply grown to include uh, 11 partners across North America, United States, Canada, um, the Caribbean. And then this past year, we added an Asia chapter. So we have two schools in Indonesia that have been added to the fellowship. Um, next year, we're expecting to add another school from the Philippines. Um, the Asia chapter has not as of yet interacted with the North America chapter because of the time zone differences. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were looking about a, a 10 hour difference, so 12 hour difference. So we had to figure out a time that was conducive to presenting the information to them while also conducive to the, the time. So for us, so a lot of 7 a.m., 8 a.m. workshops for them, and that would be 6 or 7 a.m. There's 6 or 7 p.m. for them. So let me turn it over to Shinta at this point to talk about the objectives, and then um, she'll continue. Shinta. Great. Thank you, Mike. Hello again, everybody. It's good to, to be here to talk about our work. So if we could sum up the objectives of this fellowship, this is how I would, these are the keywords I would say, equitable access, social justice, empowerment, and collaboration. So as you can see from these three bubbles, what this fellowship has allowed uh, the participants, the fellows to accomplish is that when they create and deliver these renewable assignments that are openly licensed through a Creative Commons license, and sometimes the student projects too are openly licensed with students' permission, they're providing this wealth of knowledge and information to the whole wide world, really, so that um, it could be shared everywhere, right? And so, and when we decided to marry or intersect the United Nations Global sustainable development goals with the open pedagogy piece, we're really held accountable for global justice, achieving global justice by way of those 17 goals. And this international partnership, as um, Mike pointed out, that's, that really started with, with Rajiv and Kwantlen Polytechnic University has just exploded, boomed, and we continue to see such great interest across the world um, in, in being a part of this. And then also what is really, to me, probably the most heartfelt as a former faculty member is what students say about it. Their experience and their, um, their testimonials have suggested that being a part of this fellowship by doing the student projects that the renewal assignments called for have empowered them in so many different ways that it has for some of these students have been life-changing outcomes. So we're really proud to, to be able to continue putting forward these objectives and, and meeting them. And We've often been asked, you know, what, what does it take? What does it look like on the on the back end? So part of run, part of this fellowship is is being able to continuously grow the leadership team. It's to be able to 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 navigate, manage, and continue to build the practice of our leaders. And so our leadership team meets for an entire year now. It used to be in the first couple of years that we would meet three months prior to the launch of the summer fellowship. 
um, and thought that was enough time, but only to find out that because of its growth and expansion and, and impact, we really have called this to be a year long process. And so that year long process for the, for the leadership team really truly begins in March when officially we put out the call for applications to our respective institutions. Um, then when we decide to select these faculty fellows who by the way are paired up in interdisciplinary cross institutional faculty teams, they come to the fellowship over the summer months these are required meetings. They meet with their partners by way of by way of Zoom, and they start thinking about what renewable assignments they will come up with. And these renewable assignments get deployed in the following fall semester. Uh, and this is where you see you begin to see the students becoming agents of change in their communities, because that is one of the things that we we ask um, the, the faculty teams to incorporate when they create these renewable assignments. And at the end of the, of the fall semester, we ask the faculty to reflect. Tell us how how was your experience? What did you all think? What are areas that could be enhanced and areas that we might um, want to consider some improvements or opportunities for for growth? We really truly um, take those feedback into heavy consideration because we always want the the next iteration to be um, even more enhanced for both the the faculty fellows as well as the students. And then around March, back into open ed week, um, which is essentially when we launched the application process, there is an optional faculty student showcase of their work together. And we have heard from students how um, thrilled they get they are when they get to present. And in the past, it's, it has been um, sponsored by the Arizona OER Regional Showcase, which has essentially now become an international showcase or an international conference. And what an amazing thing for our students to be able to put on their resume or their application when they think about transferring to another institution afterwards. So we basically have laid out for you what this year long process looks like for the leadership team as well as the faculty fellows. And then here is essentially a, the, what the specific timeline looks like for the fellows themselves. So as I mentioned, they fill out the application um, and before the application actually is deployed, we have information sessions that uh, our institutions do at their respective places, because we want our fellows or potential fellows to know what, what the expectations are, what is the fellowship about. Um, and so we do do that prior to the March application process. We make the decision um, with the pairings around April, and then this, the fellowship, as we mentioned before, um, covers the summer months, June through August with required meetings. And then the work gets um, deployed in the fall. And like I said, there's that optional student showcase, student faculty showcase that happens that following March in the spring semester again. So here is the uh, here are the logos of all of our partners to date. And I would imagine that um, this time next year, we're gonna add more logos to our to our slides. And, and we're really thrilled about that. We're always excited to hear when institutions come to us with, with passion. Um, and, and that's exactly what we want when we, when we create our, or when we, when we grow our leadership team. But again, just to give you a sense of what, what the leadership team does, it is, like I said, a year long process for us. We meet monthly. And in these monthly meetings, we're tackling continuously um, different parts of the, of the work. We tackle the curriculum piece. We, we're always revisiting, you know, are, are these issues or topics some things that we want to continue? If so, is there a different way to, um, to deploy it? Um, are there additional things we ought to be covering? For example, artificial intelligence is one of the things that we're talking about right now among the leadership team um, and figuring out how we're gonna incorporate that into next summer's fellowship program. And one of the things that uh, we we believe we find um, useful is that there is a structured onboarding of new institutional partners. So uh, Mike and I specifically, and of course anyone else from the leadership team who wants to be a part of this, will will have the opportunity to talk with new members, new partners, and talk to their faculty potential faculty fellows. Um, and answer any questions that they might have. And so that that structured and, and um, intentional onboarding uh, is important for a successful partnership. And I think many of our partners who are listed here could probably uh, agree with me on, on that one. And then in these um, leadership 
meetings that we have, which by the way is is very much cross functional uh, across our our twelve partners here, which is what makes I think this this team a lot of fun to work with, and just really talented as well, because we have a team of on this team of administrators, um, de- uh, uh, librarians, uh, instructional designers. I mean, it, it runs the gamut. So we bring different areas of expertise to to the um, continued development of this fellowship. And one of the things that we've found that we've um, done done successfully is subcommittees to tackle specific areas of the fellowship. Uh, Some examples of that is we had a subcommittee working on uh, professional development to help, um, you know, for example, faculty fellows who want to present somewhere, provide them with information on that uh, in that area. We've had um, recruitment, uh, subcommittee on recruitment. So that subcommittee would be responsible for going out and um, sharing information and and um, providing whatever information potential partners could could and want to to have. Um, we also have a communication subcommittee responsible for the marketing piece, and and so it really and and these subcommittees will will evolve over time and depending on what topics are needed as time goes on. There is also a brand new piece here that um, we will start deploying for this prior to the summer, which is an intentional mentorship of the leadership team to the fellows. And so what that means is that we will pair up each one of us on the leadership team with the faculty team and have continuous conversations with our assigned faculty teams prior to the start of the fellowship and even after so that our, our mentees, our fellows are positioned in the best ways possible. Thank you, Shinta. Uh, We are often asked at this point, how much does it cost to be part of this fellowship from an institution? It doesn't cost the institution anything. Uh, We have it set up with this leadership team because each institution is different. And the faculty fellows go through their institution to apply. And then the institution itself decides who's accepted, who's not accepted. Um, We don't do that on our end at Montgomery College solely in a vacuum. So it's really a partnership of institutional leaders. And I I wanna recognize Christine Crafton, who's in the back um, as a member of the leadership team. Uh, Jamie Whitman, I don't know if Jamie, Jamie, uh, when she was at CCBC, she was part of the, the leadership team. And we've had conversations with Jessica about Salisbury joining this work. Uh, So it's open to any institution. We simply ask that there be an institutional commitment to the work um, as we we move forward. So we we track the growth of of this fellowship since we started in 2018. And I wanna highlight the the areas in yellow that were from this, this last, summer, this, this current cohort. Um, we're touching 143 sections of courses this semester. So if you look at the number of students, 5,100 students are enrolled in those sections. We have some institutions where one faculty member is touching a 1,000 students and his colleagues because he, they're using the assignments that they created in 20 or so different courses. And that's the beauty of open is that it can be shared across the spectrum. Um, so we're, we're really happy with that growth. We're often asked as well, what SDGs are the, the most popular? And if I go back a few slides, and you look at those 17 SDGs, which ones do you think faculty would gravitate toward in developing assignments for their students? Number four, yep, quality education, 10. Uh, okay, reduced inequalities, good. Uh, yeah, uh, all of those, gender equality, uh, peace, justice, strong issues. We're seeing a lot more on number 13 as you can imagine, with climate action. Um, And it doesn't matter whether we're seeing this from faculty in Indonesia, Arizona, Canada, Aruba, Costa Rica, 
they're all focusing on similar SDGs because we all have those problems. I've often, I've often said, my generation has done its best to destroy this planet. And we've been pretty successful at it. Uh, students are really interested in fixing this planet, which is why they had such a, a broad interest in these assignments and this growth. So how do we engage the, the students and the, the faculty in this world? Uh, Shinta mentioned that it is an interdisciplinary, interinstitutional approach, which means an English faculty from Montgomery College may be paired with a biology faculty from a school in Canada. And they hate it. <laughs> they come into it hating it. Um, most of us as faculty don't do interdisciplinary really well. We know our own disciplines, but tell me as a journalist that I have to work with a math person. It's like, there's a reason I went into journalism. <laughs> if I wanted to do math, I would have gone into math. Uh, so we don't do that well. We force them into this work. And when they apply, we ask them not only to listen, list their discipline, but their preferred SDGs. And so we try to match them accordingly. Uh, at the OE Global Conference in Edmonton uh, just last month, there was a, a big focus on this concept of two-eyed seeing. And I encourage you to, to Google that. Um, and it's two-eyed seeing was initiated with the idea that with one eye, you look at Westerners look at things through an indigenous people's lens and the other eye, indigenous people look at it through a Western lens. I love that idea because to me, that's what interdisciplinary work is. You're looking at something through a different lens. So the journalist is looking at something through a math lens. The math person is looking at something through the journalist and uh, and we provide them with a lot of faculty professional development in this space. We talk to them about what it means to have an interdisciplinary connection with someone else and why it's beneficial for their students. We schedule the, the team time for them. Uh, Shinta mentioned the workshops during the summer. Their scheduled team time built into that. Uh, as well as some open labs that we have so that faculty can just come in, drop in, ask questions, chit chat about ideas they may have. Um, and it works really well. A few years ago, we started assigning mentors to the groups and the Shinta said that's gonna be a more intentional approach because what we found is that having someone on the leadership team assigned to a faculty team and being in touch with them on a regular basis works extremely well. I, I was mentoring a, a group this past summer that was a communications faculty member from Montgomery College and a criminal justice uh, faculty member from Nova Scotia Community College in Canada. And they they just had, they had ideas, but they didn't know where they wanted to go with their assignments because in the creation of the assignments, they have to be interdisciplinary in nature. And so talking through all of that was helpful for them. They even had the idea where not only did they want to create, they had to create joint assignments, but they wanted their students to work jointly together in developing the projects. And Logistically, it didn't work out, but we're, we're excited about that. I mentioned earlier that the interdisciplinary, interinstitutional approach, a lot of people didn't like. And we, we tell them, this fellowship is going to take you out of your comfort zone. By the end of the summer, you can see that the magic has happened. They, they absolutely love the work they do. And it doesn't stop the semester they deploy the assignments. We still have faculty from 2017 who have just different iterations of the assignment that they created 
five or six years ago. And they're building on that assignment. So uh, the engagement is, is critical. Shinta, you wanna take this one? Absolutely, thank you. So we have a, a, a huge selection of these renewable assignments um, and that we put it in a press books that Christine Crafton, who is in the audience, she manages that the publication of that. Um, so we'll share with you that resource in a minute, but I wanted to share with you one example of an instructor and his student in his project, as well as his students production or project. And this is one, a, a pair that we have, um, asked to come on a road show with, with us because they we believe they've just done a phenomenal job. And in addition to that, we've heard from the student about how the fellowship has really touched her and changed her life. So we this is a an anthropology instructor from Montgomery College, Professor Zeb Kossin, who was with us during our second year of the fellowship. And he was paired with two people from Kwantlen Polytechnic University. So at that time, that year, it was only Montgomery College and KPU. And so with him, his project was interdisciplinary in the sense that it was tied in with um, horticulture and anthropology disciplines. And he created this project called Rooting Out Hunger, Plants, Weeds, and Anthropology and Student-Centered Learning. And so he had asked his students to, to go around the Montgomery College campus and look for plants and weeds. And and they had to um, document all of this on a program called iNaturalist, iNaturalist.com. Feel free to, to take a look at that when you can. And it's really interesting and exciting for the students because um, what a way to engage them in experiential learning. What a way to engage them in um, the, the idea of, of global justice by way of food insecurity, um, the natural environment. And so basically his charge to the students was find the plants and weeds and see how we can make something out of it so as to combat food insecurity. And so you could see the two goals that um, that Professor Zeb Kossin uh, anchored his assignments on. It's zero hunger and sustainable cities and communities. So his student, student Parveen Hussein, who I just recently found out graduated already um, and is now working at Montgomery College. So talk about full circle. She enjoyed it so much here with us that she's now an employee here. But what she did on the right side is she made a recipe book. And so all the different plants and weeds that she found, she put it into a recipe book that now everyone can take a look at and um, be able to use. And it's such a practical thing that came out of her student project. So I certainly recommend um, when you take a look at that press books, we'll give you the resource in a minute. Uh, look at these amazing uh, renewable assignments and student projects. One of the things that we did early on in our, our fellowship was we asked students, we, we brought them in, had a panel discussion in front of the, the faculty and told them to tell the faculty what types of assignments you don't like. And they, they asked, you know, when we were talking to them off to the side, really, we, we can tell them the types of assignments we hate what if I have this professor next semester? And we said, it'll be fine. And as you know, when you ask students for their input, they're going to be brutally honest. And to a person, they said, we hate the traditional research paper. So using this example, the faculty member may have said, write a research paper on food deserts. And the Student would have done what he or she was told, but instead he asked the students, go out onto the campuses and find out what plants and or weeds are on your campus that would eliminate the idea of a food desert. Uh, so you can see the involvement from the student perspective, much more engaged, much more experiential and much more enthusiastic. Shinta. Thank you. So ways that we have engaged past and continue to engage future participants. And Mike had mentioned that um, some of our fellows continue to utilize the tools and, um, and knowledge that they received from being in the fellowship uh, years in the prior. We have actually asked uh, those fellows to help us champion the work 
and showcase how have they reiterated the the the, um, the assignments and so it really is wonderful to see and so we asked them to join us in information sessions that we conduct and I had mentioned earlier that information uh, generally happen right around the time that right right before we, we deploy the application process during open education week but a lot of times when fa faculty come into these information sessions they want to hear from us of course to learn about the fellowship but they truly want to hear from the fellows past fellows and past students that has been so powerful and and um so we continue to do that and throughout open education week as many of you know it's the the first full week in march every year we celebrate our faculty uh the, particularly those who participated in these fellowships we do a lot of a couple of different things one is again to showcase them uh through presentations um, videos, blogs, that sort of thing. And ever, all of our institutions do different things to showcase and celebrate our um, past participants. And really it does draw the interest of those who are interested in applying for the, the fellowship. And these testimonials, as I mentioned, we, we have asked our fellows to provide us testimonials, um, really all sorts. We want them to be honest and, and to tell us how their experience went. But we capture them on a Padlet. We kept, we've captured them on a video before. Um, again, a lot of our institutional partners do different um, ways of capturing. But primarily on this Padlet that um, Christine Crafton created allows us to see and, and read how things have gone for, for our fellows. And just here, we kind of did an, um, a snapshot of some of the things that our fellows have said about the work that they experienced through this fellowship. I, I love the quote that is up the upper left here. Uh, it opened students up to what they wanted to do. We had a biology faculty member who was paired with a sociology faculty member, and they were focusing on iron deficiency and different locations of individuals and their iron deficiency. And so the biology faculty member told his students, the, the assignment was really focused on iron deficiency from a, a food standpoint and what that can do to an individual. So he allowed the students to write a paper, do a PowerPoint, do a, a Padlet, do a video. This one particular student took it upon himself to marry his hobby of glass blowing with the assignment. So he created two models. One of blood cells that were iron deficient and one model of an individual whose blood cells were not iron deficient. And so he presented that and he said that it was the best assignment he ever had and it scared him to death because he, he asked the professor, are you sure I can do whatever I want? <laughs> and we're all creatures of habit. We say we don't want the research paper, but when you say you don't have to do the research paper, like, no, give me the research paper. Is that, I'm comfortable with that. It's like coming back into this room. Many of you are probably in a similar area to where you were this morning. So he created this wonderfully done glass blown example. And we were on Zoom one day recording him about it and, and his name was Freddie and Freddie makes a sudden move on a table that is on wheels and you hear in the background this crashing of glass and, and so Shinta, me and the faculty member have this look of horror on our face right this this project that the student said he'll remember forever it's going to be remembered for all the wrong reasons. And, and he so graciously said, don't worry about it. It's my hobby. And I love the assignment so much. I'm going to go back and just do another one. And so he did. Uh, but that's how much impact these assignments can have on students. Because we want students to leave our classes and remember the assignments that we gave them years later. I, I tell the story of when I was a, 
freshman in college many, many years ago. I had a sociology professor who it was a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. And he came in on Monday, and, and this was before the idea of open pedagogy even existed, right? He, he came in on Monday and he took two glasses of water and for 50 minutes just proceeded to pour them back and forth as he lectured. Saying, so, okay, I'm 18 years old. This guy's a whack job. <laughs> right? Okay, so that you know, he did that for 50 minutes. Came back on Wednesday and he had an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And as he talked about sociology, he proceeded to just fold that paper in half and rip it apart, tear it in half for 50 minutes. And his name was Dr. Sherwin, That's it, or Sherman. It's like, okay, professor, you're not helping your cause here. You were a whack job on Monday. You're a whack job on Wednesday. So Friday we come back and thinking, what, what could this man possibly do now? Or he had a cowbell around his neck. <laughs> and as he walked up and down the, the class, this cowbell rang. Finally, we get to the end of the class. And he says, you know, if you're wondering why I did those three things, it was all about focusing on listening to me and what I'm talking about and not on what I'm doing. And it was like, okay, this this was an assignment in that I could that resonated with me. And it's been a long time since I had that class, but it's still something I remember. And my guess is that the young woman who created the recipe from the milk rose weed and the glass blowing student will remember those assignments for a long, long time. Shinta, you want to take this one? Sure. So a couple of years ago, at this point, three years ago, we were fortunate to have received the Open Pedagogy Award for Excellence. That's one of the awards that's distributed by Open Education Global. And so this award provides recognition to those who um, contribute outstanding ways in the open education community. And so when we, when we see this award, we really just want to extend our congratulations to the faculty members and their students for embarking on a journey that as Mike pointed out, made them feel uneasy from the start. Many of them hated it, right? They they participate in the fellowship because they're interested and, and uh, intrigued by it, but they hate the idea of going outside of that comfort zone. But we continue to stress that it's when you go out of your comfort zone is when that magic happens. And they see it eventually, um, sometimes before the fellowship program is over, sometimes after. But through their innovation, through their creativity, through their uh, collaboration, and through their partnership with their students to kind of make those, those lines fuzzy and say, I wanna partner with my students on this. Those are all the reasons why we received this award. And so again, I just wanna extend my congratulations to the faculty and their students. Here's a list of resources that we'll make available to you. This QR code, takes you to the Montgomery College website. And before we get into uh, questions, and those of you who are online, if you'd be happy to post your questions in the chat, we'll, we'll take a look at those. Uh, the links are, the, the first link is the International Fellowship website from our, our colleagues up in Canada. Uh, Robin had mentioned the press book this morning. Uh, that's the, the second link for you. And the third link is a repository of the assignments. The toolkit has some exemplar ex assignments. This repository provides re assignments broken down by SDG. So if you go to that link, that repository, and you're looking for an assignment on quality education, You'll be able to click on the icon for uh, SDG number four and find those assignments that have been created for um, SDG number four. All of the assignments are openly licensed. <laughs> That's part of that information session. Um, faculty professional development, we do a lot of work with faculty 
on Creative Commons because they don't necessarily understand Creative Commons. Um, I will tell you the international aspect of this partnership has lent itself to a lot of Creative Commons focus because copyright laws are different in Canada, the United States, and Indonesia. We found ourselves this summer having to understand Indonesian copyright. Uh, so by focusing on the Creative Commons aspect, which is an international recognized license, it makes it easier for the faculty to understand that, hey, I can simply open my work, make it openly licensed, share it, and I don't have to worry about my individual country's copyright um, rules and laws. Uh, there's our contact information. Um, Shinta's is, is blocked by the closed captioning, uh, but it's shinta.hernandez at montgomerycollege.edu. And with that, we're happy to open to any questions that, that you may have. And please don't be shy. Um, that is a, a link to the Montgomery College SDG website. Okay, thank you. So we, we have a variety of resources there. Thank you. <laughs> um, we can start with any questions in the room. One of the questions we often get is how much fat, how much do faculty get paid to go through the fellowship? <laughs> and for those of you who are faculty, that's an important question. Uh, that is an institutional decision. At Montgomery College, we provide faculty with what amounts to um, release time, you know, partial release time for a course. Some of our other institutional partners provide a stipend. Some don't provide anything. They, they just ask for volunteers. Uh, it depends on the culture of the institution, really, and, and what's expected at that institution. But it, it varies, uh, which is also why we have this leadership team to navigate those situations unique to an institution. I don't know what the culture, faculty culture, is at Maricopa Community College. If I got a question about how much am I getting paid at Maricopa, I'd have no idea. So we have someone from Maricopa who is on that partnership team who can address that with our faculty. Hi, I have a question, please. I love the ideas of alternative ways to demonstrate learning. That's amazing. From a instructor's point of view, how do you assess that learning. Shinta, you want to tackle that? Sure. Um, we, cert we have a set of, during the fellowship program, we have a set of documents that we provide to the fellows as far as what um, the expectations are as they think about renewable assignments. And so for us on our end, we're really just looking at how are you incorporating the UN SDGs? How are, how are these assignments um, incorporating the multiple disciplines that are being represented by the faculty team. Sometimes it's a, a pair, so it's two disciplines. Sometimes it's a trio or three disciplines. And how is this um, considered a renewable assignment? Uh, how are the students engaged in the community? So we do have a list of questions um, and guidelines that we uh, give to our fellows so that when during team time, which happens at the end of each of the required meetings, they go through those documents and make sure that they're hitting on all those things. So it's sort of, you know, quote unquote, a rubric of our of our of our kind um, to help the faculty teams know what to, to what to meet. And I, is your question geared toward the student projects? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So from a student project standpoint, each of the faculty knows what the learning outcomes for that assignment is. We encourage them to create rubrics based on those learning outcomes, not the project itself. Okay, so you have a series of learning outcomes. It does. It shouldn't matter whether the student does a paper, PowerPoint, video. You know what you want the student to meet and convey in that assignment. 
So we encourage them to use a rubric based on those learning outcomes. Uh, maybe to a little, to an extent. Yeah, probably. Uh, but if they develop that rubric and develop it well enough, the students know going in what they have to provide in that assignment, no matter what uh, mechanism they use to create that assignment. Jessica, do you have any online questions? Okay. Another question, any other questions in the room? Yep. Hi, I'm Brittany from Salisbury. Do you have to do any reporting to the United Nations on the impact that you guys are doing on the SDGs or no? No, we don't have to. Okay. Um, a few years ago, Rajiv um, Janagiani had the opportunity to testify at the um, UN and he talked about this program. Uh, we don't have to report anything. Uh, we're a member of the United Nations SDG Academy, and so they know about the work we're doing. Yeah. Well, I was just going to build on the question about assessment because I, I wondered the same thing. How do you assess glass blowing? <laughs> Depend and it, of course, it comes back to it depends on what the outcome is that you're so hoping that the student will be working towards achieving. Um, but I also thought about you know depending on what you've got in your outcome statement and your rubric. You know, you can we can work with the student, but you can kind of put it to the student to say, OK, your your artistic visual representation is going to be able to capture X, Y and Z. But maybe you need something else to help you with this last piece that's in the rubric. So I'm imagining, though, it's something like real world that could be helpful for the student if they actually did want to pursue their hobby and say in a professional way. How do we help you develop maybe an artist statement that can help you talk about what you were hoping to accomplish through this artistic piece and do some integration of concept A, concept B, concept C, because maybe that's something else that you want in your rubric. So there could be materials that are created around the main thing that the student has created, and they could kind of submit the whole package. And you know, the student could even identify, this is going to be talking about, you know, the two things over here that I'm supposed to accomplish. And my artist statement is going to be talking about this third piece, something like that. Well, we've had some faculty pair their students in teams to focus on the learning outcome. So they may have a student who does the glass blow and another student who addresses the learning outcome in another modality. And together they can reach that common ground. Um, like you said, Nancy, um, we've, we've had a lot of faculty teach their students presentation skills that they may not have otherwise employed. So a lot of our students now understand how to create infographics because of these assignments, something that they wouldn't necessarily have learned outside of the opportunity to uh, create alternative assignments. I have a question from the chat. Uh, do you have alternative assignments with indigenous knowledge? Do alternative assignments have CC licenses? Shinta, do you hear the question? Yes. So the, one of the requirements of that fellows would understand prior to, to joining is that their renewable assignments will have to have Creative Commons license because we then put it onto this Pressbooks or the repository so that it can be shared with everyone. Um, now, the, the first question, so I'm kind of going backwards here. The first question, do the assignments with Indigenous knowledge? I recall a handful of, of assignments that do have Indigenous knowledge. I recommend that um, you all take a look at the press books to kind of see what else, what other assignments are out there with, with the similar knowledge base. But I will say that our open education global conference that we just had in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, um, Mike mentioned the two-eyed seeing perspective. Uh, we, we just really opened it up for us, this, this conference, because we're looking at the fellowship in a much, much slightly different way now in terms of um, incorporating indigenous knowledge into, into the fellowship. And we're also looking at opportunities for us to intentionally um, partner with institutions that do specifically focus on indigenous populations. Uh, so there is more to come in that space. We, we've noticed that our Canadian partners, especially our Western um, Canadian partners, have this more as a focal point than we do here on the East Coast of the United States. So our, our partners in Alberta, that area, where there is a large population of indigenous people, um, 
those assignments do have and can have more of a focus um, than, than we do here on the East Coast. So you're, we're starting to see a lot more of that. Um, we're starting to see more of that creep into our colleagues' work in Indonesia. Um, all of those assignments were created and submitted in English, but during the course of the discussion, they wanted to know, well, can we create these and deploy these in Indonesian? Because it will reach a larger population of, of individuals. So that's something we're also exploring there. Yes. Hi, my name is Mohamed Samara, I'm with UMBC. Um, I was wondering how you incorporate multimodality, cultural differences, in the assignment creation and co-creation. Um, you know, you talked about the artistic piece. That's a wonderful example, but not everyone is artistic. Uh, perhaps, you know, they're not visual learner. Uh, how do we apply multimodality even in the co-creation of a student who's like a visual learner to enable other non-visual learners or multimodal learners to actually effectively understand what they produce? So it, the, the work doesn't have to be a, a visual representation. It, it can be the creation of a podcast, for example. So our, we've, we've had a team in Indonesia that was creating a, a media campaign or having their students create a media campaign that focused on social media, television, and radio. So it, it, that's one aspect of it. And then as the, the faculty work through their assignments, they tackle this idea of cultural differences. So the, the criminal justice faculty uh, member that I mentioned from Nova Scotia, it's a rural community college paired with a communications faculty member in Silver Spring, Maryland. Very, very urban. Different populations, different groups of people. They had to work together to develop that assignment so that it spoke and resonated with each group of individual, uh, which is why they were trying to get their students to work together. Uh, because the Nova Scotia students were rural, not a, a lot of urban center experience. The Silver Spring students didn't have a whole lot of experience outside of Silver Spring. And so trying to get them to, to marry their ideas and, and projects, um, you know, is a, the next iteration of this, I think. Monica looks like Phil Donahue and Oprah going back and forth. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Alketanina. I have a question about the logistics, and maybe I missed this in the beginning. I'm not sure. So, um, the how do the students enroll in this, and where do they earn credits? So, the, the, the students are students at their institution. The faculty members deploy the assignments at their own institution. They're co created, but they're deployed locally. So, the students don't they earn credits at their own institution. They don't necessarily interact with students elsewhere. But what do they earn credits on? So if it's- There's yes. their course. So if it's a sociology course, for example, the assignment is just deployed in the sociology course. And it, it would be no different than deploying a test. So- the the instructors so there might be an anthropologist and a sociologist but those two are from different institutions yeah. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. so it's not two professors from the same institution yeah. We've, okay gotcha yeah. that makes more sense they're not teaching together they're they're yeah, right. assignments yes. in a way and then taking their assignment back yeah they're, from days teaching and they're not co-teaching yes uh i think it's a kind of a repetition of that question sorry uh, uh how do I get interested in it? Do we have a rubric or I'm just telling myself like, yeah, I would be yeah, in this team and approach my institution accordingly. Where, where do I begin? Uh, if your institution is interested or if you're interested in getting your institution involved, uh, just see me afterwards. I have some cards, we'll, we'll communicate. Uh, 
get some dialogue going. Uh, for one of the, the beauties of the toolkit is that it allows individuals to implement this program in their courses, even if their institution is not a member of the fellowship. And we, we've seen that before. We have a, a good friend, Shauna Bramble at Kingsborough Community College in New York, who has taken this work and implemented it in her class, but her institution is not part of the fellowship. She just loved the idea of incorporating open pedagogy in the SDGs. So uh, there, are, there are opportunities for individuals to do this work uh, outside of the institutional aspect. No, it does not go into the repository. Uh, the the repo repository is for those co-created assignments. Yes. It's another kind of deep dive into the nitty gritty of the co-creation of the assignments. Do they, I understand there are two different disciplines represented. They take the assignments back to their own uh, course in their own institution. Are they actually using the same assignments or do they come up with learning objectives that fit their disciplines? Or does that matter? Or does that de depend on the teams and sure. what they come up with? Sure, I can answer that. Um, so the one of the requirements of the fellowship is that they each team creates three renewable assignments, but they are actually only required to deploy two of them. And each faculty member of the team can decide which two they want to deploy. So one faculty member can, can distribute assignment A and B. The other faculty member can say, you know what, I'd, I'd rather do B and C instead. Uh, or they could do A, B, and C. Um, so, so that piece, um, you know, it, it really is up to the faculty member. But the, the assignments are pretty much exactly the same. They might make some modifications uh, that are considered minor. But um, essentially, they, they are the same. And as I mentioned earlier, with one of the earlier questions, we do have a rubric that we share with the fellows during the summer program that allows them to kind of um, see what, what things they have to touch on as they develop these assignments together, like the interdisciplinary connections, the incorporation of the UN SDGs, how are they going to make their students um, ages of change in their community, so on and so forth. One of the things we're seeing more and more faculty do is scaffold their assignments. So instead of creating three separate assignments, the team is in essence creating three assignments, but they build on one another. And that's been real effective and, and we're, we're excited to see that happen because that I think has allowed them to more easily develop this interdisciplinary approach uh, as they can build on, on one another. Hi, I'm Natasha from Salisbury, and uh, I was wondering, um, so if a, a teacher takes from uh, an idea from the toolkit um, and they modify in some way, um, is there a way for them to add to the toolkit? This is what I did. This was my iteration of it, or is it just the original that is uh, stayed? The, the toolkit at this point is the original documents, uh, but we encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, download the assignments that you can download, modify them, use them. Um, they're all openly licensed. And you can always share them back on the most comments. Yes. <laughs> and we have a space on the most comments uh, where these assignments are, are located. And in, and in fact, many of your institutions have a space on yeah. the most comments to share things yep. with each other. Yep. Okay, I think we're just about at time. So I'd like to say thank you to the Montgomery College team. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.